Is autism research inherently biased against autistic people? Stay tuned. Hi everybody, welcome back to Psy vs. Psy, where we talk about all things psychology. So if that's something you find interesting, we hope you'll check out our other videos and consider subscribing. Unlike most psychology channels, we cite our sources, and we end every video with hilarious memes and jokes. Oh, SciShow doesn't do any of that? Oh, okay. As our regular viewers will know, one of our special interests is autism. Today, I'm going to highlight some issues in autism research, but these criticisms probably apply to many areas of science surrounding the study of differences in behavior. One of the unique issues surrounding autism is that charities and research organizations may be actively working against the best interests of the very population they claim to help. Now, while you don't have to Google very far to find out what I'm talking about, today I hope to show you one example of how this translates into the scientific literature. Personally, I like to think of the science as a pristine and pure thing, immune to bias and beautiful in its pure objectivity. Back in reality, though, I can't help but notice how many researchers who study autism begin with biases against autistic people, usually the people who they're claiming to help, by overly pathologizing things that aren't necessarily pathological. Now, the way this shows up in the literature is as biased and value-laden language, where any difference observed between autistics and neurotypicals is viewed as an impairment or deficit, even when actual performance on the task may be better for autistics than for their neurotypical counterparts. For neuroimaging studies, any differences in brain activity is couched as poor functioning or maladaptive. Now, the literature is so ripe with examples, I really didn't have to dig very deep to get source material for this video, and I actually had to pare down the list of studies. But let's look at a few examples of this phenomenon in action. First up, we have a hot off the press study of the development of so-called moral emotions, things like pride, shame, and guilt. Now, the authors start out touting the importance of these emotions in developing moral behavior and in encouraging people to be pro-social. The goal of the study is to connect what they call impairments and struggles in theory of mind to reduced moral emotions in autistic kids. So they followed kids from an autism treatment center over the course of about three years and gave them tests every year to see whether they exhibited pride, shame, and guilt. Now, while they didn't see much difference in pride, Autistic kids showed less shame and less guilt than typically developing children, an effect that got stronger with age. To quote the authors, this is alarming given that appropriate experience and expression of shame and guilt play a crucial role in preventing behavioral problems and promoting psychosocial well-being. Oh my God, this sounds scary. Now, to be fair, they stop short of saying that autistic people can't be moral or altruistic, so... Kudos, I guess. So what were these tasks that they were using to measure shame and guilt? It turns out that the way they measure them are really important. Now, to make the kids feel guilty, they would do something called the broken car task, where they would hand the kid a car where the wheels were loose, so they would fall off when they played with it. Now, this would presumably cause some guilt. To examine shame, they did two tasks. The researcher would make a drawing and ask the kid to copy it, and then tell the kid they did a terrible job. Or second, they would take a medicine bottle with a childproof cap, show the kid, oh, it's easy to remove this cap, and then ask the kid to remove it too. Of course, the kid was likely to fail when they tried to remove the cap. The psychologist giving this test scored each kid's response to the situations for things like pouting and turning away, collapsed body, and something they describe as negative response to the situation, whatever that means. Okay, well, wait a second. Now I have a few questions. First, did the psychologist know which kids were autistic and which ones weren't? It seems likely that the researcher wasn't blind to the conditions, which is a big no-no in any study that involves scoring behaviors. But also, how do we know that not expressing the emotion through facial expressions and such is the same as not experiencing the emotion? One of the key elements of autism is differences in emotional expression. That doesn't mean they don't have the emotions. But also, aren't these tasks a little silly? 
Maybe autistic kids don't feel guilty because they know they didn't break the car, that it was already broken when it was given to them. Or they knew their drawing was actually pretty good, or that the experimenter was trying to trick them with the bottle. Maybe they're used to being mistreated and told everything they do is wrong in their daily lives and through learned helplessness are less reactive to those feelings. Not only that, some therapies for autism actively discourage expression of negative emotions or discomfort. Now, any one of these issues could explain the observed results without the so-called deficit or impairment in the autistic group. All right, well, maybe I'm just picking on one cherry-picked paper that got through the system somehow. How do we know how widespread this problem is? Well, there's at least one research group who's been working for a long time to highlight these issues. In this 2014 commentary, Gernsbacher, Dawson, and Matron gave a number of examples where researchers go out of their way to explain why enhanced performance by autistic people in a variety of tasks are actually evidence of deficits engaging in all sorts of mental gymnastics along the way to fit their pre-existing bias towards autism always being an impairment. Now, one of those authors, Michelle Dawson, has a curated Twitter feed of autism research where you can find exactly this kind of thing. You'll find dozens and dozens of examples. I'll leave a link down in the description to her Twitter account, but let's look at a couple other studies. In this study, also of moral behavior, people were given a chance to accept an offer of some money, but if they did, it would also help a morally bad cause, which in this case aimed to exterminate street animals. Autistic people were less likely to take the crooked deal than neurotypical controls. In other words, autistic people made the more moral choice of foregoing their own personal gain if it had an overall negative outcome. You know, like how you have to make personal sacrifices to combat climate change, as autistic activist Greta Thunberg has championed. Of course, the author's interpretation was that this was a deficit because autistics were excessively valuing the negative consequences of making the immoral choice. Autistic people are too moral, according to this example. But remember from the last study how stunted their moral development is? Here's another study where they had adolescent participants watch emotion-inducing videos like a lady eating a spider or a kitten being tickled. Researchers recorded the reactions and rated facial expressions. All of the autistic kids exhibited facial expressions and did things like laugh when a funny video was presented, whereas only 65% of the neurotypical controls made any response at all. But of course, autistic kids have to fit the emotional deficit narrative. So how was this interpreted? The authors make sense of this by saying, to understand these data, we propose that responses of TD participants, that's typically developing participants, were socially modulated, despite our intentions to create a non-social context. Display rules dictate that individuals dampen facial expressions and laughter when they are socially inappropriate. In other words, the whole design of the experiment was to eliminate social cues, but they must have done it wrong and social cues must have still been there. This allows them to argue that autistic people were unable to adequately adapt to the social situation, which wasn't really social, but it must have been because how else could we understand these results unless these autistic people are impaired in some way? In the discussion, where authors would typically discuss alternative interpretations, Oh, uh, well, they didn't bother to consider a single alternative possibility to this story. By the way, in this paper, the word deficit appears at least five times and impairment appears four times in addition to similar language. So while the earlier study said autistic kids had a deficit because they didn't show the emotions on their face, according to this study, they apparently have a deficit when they do wear the expression on their face. Neurotypicals up three to nothing. Heads I win, tails you lose. Next up, here's a study that's been cited 313 times since its publication in 2017. Now that's a lot of people building upon or at least mentioning this research. They had participants complete a task in which people had to classify a picture as either a house or a face. Easy enough. But they also played a tone before each trial. So they would play either a high-pitched or a low-pitched beep before they showed the picture that the person had to classify. Now, in the beginning, the high-pitched tone might be presented almost always with the houses and the low pitch with the faces. However, they then presented the low-pitched tone with a house. It turns out that neurotypical people's performance goes down when the tone doesn't match the picture category. 
But for autistic people, they didn't lose any accuracy when this occurred. So before we look at what the author said about this result, let's think. Maybe autistic people didn't learn the tone prediction. Maybe they did learn it, but they were just better at ignoring the irrelevant information. Maybe they're more focused on the stimulus and less driven by their expectations. There's lots of research that suggests autistics prefer a bottom-up rather than a top-down cognitive style, which would benefit them in this particular task. Or maybe there are other explanations. Whatever the case, the authors didn't talk about any of them. Usually the discussion section of the paper should consider alternative interpretations and support why the authors prefer one explanation over another. Well, they don't do any of that. Instead, they went on to create a fancy mathematical model of autistic surprise deficit, suggesting that autistic people find everything equally surprising. In their conclusion, and this is not a joke, they wrote that while you, assuming the reader is neurotypical, might be surprised to find a pineapple in your sock drawer, an autistic person would be surprised to find the pineapple there, but also the socks. Like, just, I, I just can't. I, I'm gonna need a minute. I hope these examples highlight the problem enough. The sad thing is I have tons more of these and they're so easy to find. And these are not in crappy fly-by-night journals either. These are in major publications with high impact factors like Journal of Neuroscience and Nature Neuroscience. And they've been cited dozens or even hundreds of times. Sure, scientists are under pressure to sensationalize things to get attention, but I can't help but think that all they would need to do is ask one autistic person what's in their sock drawer to realize how ridiculous they sound. So what do we do about all this? Well, hopefully you and I can help by just being aware of the problem. In the movies, you may have heard of the Bechdel test to highlight some of the problems with representation of women in film. To pass the test, a movie, one, has to have at least two women in it, who, two, talk to each other about, three, something besides a man. Now, it's amazing how many movies can't meet such a simple benchmark. Well, I propose we invent a similar test for scientific research on autism. A study that would pass the test would, one, report the results accurately, two, without assuming that any difference observed between autistic and non-autistic individuals was a deficit of some kind, and would three, acknowledge the difference between having thoughts or feelings and expressing those thoughts and feelings. I think if someone were to systematically apply these criteria to the literature on autism, they would be surprised how few studies would pass. It's time we recognize that differences are not the same as deficits. And in fact, sometimes they may even be strengths. It's wrong to pathologize behavior simply because they're different from neurotypical individuals. And just because someone doesn't wear the expression on their face doesn't mean they don't understand. We can do better. I want to leave on some hopeful notes. Though they're in the minority right now, there are researchers out there who are aware of these problems and working to change the narrative. This article from way back in 1999 asked whether we should think of autism as a deficit or simply a difference. Researchers such as Michelle Dawson and the research group of Laurent Motron are working to raise awareness of these problems and criticize those who continue with these problematic narratives. Pelicano and Den Houding this year called for a paradigm shift in our approach to autism research, challenging the current overfocus on deficits. There are others out there too. We just have to get those voices to be loud enough so that people will realize how shameful and pervasive this problem really is. So that's an introduction to just one kind of bias that exists in autism research. If you're new here, stick around till the end of the video. I promise it's worth it. If you like what we do, hit the like button. If you want more examples like I covered in this video, trust me, they're out there, or you're interested in other kinds of bias or issues in autism research, let me know in the comments. Consider subscribing to stay up to date with all things psychology, and until next time, keep thinking. It's all socks. Are we out of pineapples?